Good evening. My name is Cecil Lytle. I am professor of music and provost of Thurgood Marshall College, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this, the first UCSD convocation of this academic year. Uh, there are many people we need to thank for filling these seats tonight. Uh, certainly the first person I would like to thank is Dr. Keith Pizzoli of Urban Studies and Planning Department because he has been bugging the Council of Provosts for the last five years to bring Dr. Brundtland to this community. So on behalf of the UCSD Convocation, we wish to thank, and I hope you would join us in thanking Dr. Keith Pizzoli for this brilliant idea. As you've seen from the announcements, this evening's convocation is jointly sponsored by the Helen Edison Lecture Series and the UCSD Council of Provosts. The Helen Edison Lecture Series benefits from the continued leadership of Dr. Mary Walshock, Associate Chancellor of University Extension. Tonight, all of us owe an enormous appreciation to two remarkable women, E.D. Monk and Mary Ann Callery, who have gone through the myriad of details to make this event possible. The UCSD Convocation was developed by the Council of Provost to bring to this community distinguished visitors who will share their knowledge and experience with UCSD faculty, students, and the, UCS and the San Diego community. We wish to dedicate this Convocation series to our very dear friend, the spirit and memory of our very dear friend, Patrick Ledden, who many of you knew. Those of you who were new students to the campus didn't have the pleasure of knowing. Professor Ledden was a professor of mathematics who taught calculus and also taught James Joyce in the literature department. It's that kind of eclecticism we wish to celebrate by having Dr. Brundtland and the other distinguished visitors with us this year. Later in this year, this academic year, on February 22nd, the convocation will host novelist Barry Lopez, author of Arctic Dreams, for which he won the National Book Award. On May 12th, Thursday, May 12th, the Spring Quarter Convocation guest will be Dr. David Hamburg, psychiatrist and former president of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. He was also awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Bill Clinton in 1996. His topic will be encouraging pro-social behavior and curtailing aggression in a post-9-11 world. It's my special pleasure to welcome to this stage to introduce Dr. Brentland, our new chancellor. We've read about her, many of us have met her and are working with her effectively already, but you should know that Marianne Fox is a physical organic chemist who became UCSD's seventh campus and the first woman named as permanent chancellor of this campus. She served for six years as chancellor at North Carolina State University. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences and has served on its executive committee. She serves on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and is co-chair of the National Research Council's Government University Industry Research Council. Her distinguished career, including 50 endowed lectureships and numerous research awards, she has been a guest in a number of countries speaking on scientific topics. Those countries include Argentina, India, Russia, Australia, Japan, Canada. And here at home, she has spoken in numerous venues, ranging from corporate boardrooms in Manhattan to the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. I assume the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo had hog calling contests, and that's a talent that probably will come in handy here at UCSD. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marianne Fox. Thank you. I'm so delighted to see so many of you here this evening to participate in a discussion that I think is of very great importance for the future of the world. We're delighted to welcome everyone to UCSD for this important event, and we're particularly fortunate to have a distinguished guest speaker, Gro Harlem Brundtland. Her extraordinary career is really an inspiration to all of us, and her lecture promises to be illuminating and thought-provoking. Dr. Brundtland has been an exemplary global citizen in her service as a physician and as a scientist, as a three-time Prime Minister of Norway, 
and as Director General of the World Health Organization. It's hard, in fact, to think of a world leader who has had a greater impact on public health, on the environment, and on sustainable economic development. Her unique vision has been her ability to integrate these spheres. She's taught the world that we cannot eradicate disease, poverty, or environmental degradation unless we tackle all three of these areas at once. Tonight, Dr. Brundtland's words will serve to reinforce UCSD's pillars of strength, innovation as a public trust, interdisciplinary scholarship, international cooperation. And it's from her personal example that we will see a demonstration of courage and integrity that are indispensable elements of leadership. Let me conclude tonight by expressing thanks to tonight's sponsors, to the UCSD Convocation Series, which is hosted by the UCSD Council of Provosts, and to the Helen Edison Lecture Series, which is coordinated by UCSD Extension. By bringing in renowned thinkers like Dr. Brundtland to deliver free public lectures, these series carry out one of our most impressive and important uh, missions, education combined with research and public service. So I am particularly delighted to see so many students who are here tonight, and also to welcome so many neighbors from the community. Welcome to UCSD, it is your school. I hope you enjoy tonight's program. I hope you'll join us in the future. As you heard from Dr. Lytle, we have a very exciting series planned for this year, and we're starting it off with the very best. Dr. Brundtland, may I invite you to join us, and welcome to UCSD. Did you forget this? It's your phone? Bring it to New York. Somebody's phone. No, not yours. Oh, it's a recorder. Someone's recording you. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> well. Here's my phone. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for that introduction. I'm glad to be here and to see such a full room. It's always uh, more inspiring when you speak when you have a great audience like the one in front of me. And I can see your faces. You know that today, in many situations, when you are a speaker, you don't see the people you speak to because they are in the black and your face is lit and you don't see a thing. But tonight I have been able to discuss that uh, I can see you as well as you see me. Um, now, I would start to say that uh, in today's world, health challenges, public health challenges, are no longer local, national, or regional, they are global. And they are no longer just within the domain of public health or health professionals, specialists, they are among the key challenges to our societies. They are political, economical, cross-sectoral. They are intimately linked to environment and development. They are key to national, regional, and global security. Historically, disease in other places was seen as an impediment to exploration and a challenge to winning a war. Cholera and other diseases killed at least three times more soldiers in the Crimean War than the actual conflict. Malaria, measles, mumps, smallpox, and typhoid felled more combatants than did bullets in the American Civil War. And the Panama Canal went over schedule because of tropical diseases then unknown, untreatable, and often fatal. Today, on that front, there are very few unknowns. Globalization has connected Boston to Bombay, Bangkok to San Diego. In an interconnected and interdependent world, bacteria and viruses 
travel almost as fast as email messages and money flows. There are no health sanctuaries, no impregnable walls between the world that is healthy, well-fed, well-off, and another world which is sick, malnourished, and impoverished. Globalization has shrunk diseases, distances, broken down old barriers and linked people together. Globalization has also made problems halfway around the world your problem, everyone's problem. And it has also made problems around the world something that we need to take seriously, that we cannot just see as kind of a film on a TV screen, it relates to all of us. And we know that like a stone thrown on the waters, a difficult social or economic situation in one community can ripple and resonate around the world. And now today there are solutions for those diseases which plague the explorers, soldiers and the colonialists of historical times. We know how to prevent and treat malaria. There are vaccines for yellow fever. There are treatments for TB. The striking feature is, however, while we diligently take anti-malarials, top up our vaccinations when we travel to developing countries, the people living there, those threatened most by these diseases, don't have that access. 3,000 children in Africa die every day from malaria. They die of vaccine-preventable diseases, like measles, by the hundreds of thousands. And people are dying by the millions every year of HIV AIDS. Now, 20 years ago, going back, HIV was a specter, all but invisible on the horizon. It was considered a disease which affected specific minorities, gay men and intravenous drug users. Science was slow to respond. The rare cancer, Kaposi sarcoma, was a marker and a sentence to die a painful, slow, and often lonely death. The world took more notice with the realization that the HIV virus knew no borders. Given the right vector, it could infect anyone. Man, woman, gay, straight, healthy and hemophiliac. By 1990, in wealthy countries, we were screening blood donors, teaching our kids how to protect themselves against HIV. Condom use had increased, incidents declined, and then antiretrovirals were made available to those who could afford them. People in countries with health insurance gained access giving tremendous hope for a longer, healthier life. In short, HIV diminished for those in rich countries as an urgent public health problem. Today, more than 42 million people are HIV positive. 30 million living in sub-Saharan Africa. They are trying to survive in some of the poorest countries and conditions with no access to the most basic health care, much less sophisticated and expensive treatment. Many have died, many are dying. They are mothers and fathers, teachers. They are nurses and other health professionals, civil servants, minors, soldiers. And they are leaving a huge social and professional gap an imminent threat to countries struggling already to develop. They are leaving orphans, penniless grandmothers caring for their children's children, family members and communities frightened, hurt, stigmatized. Health systems stretched well beyond their often frail capacities 
we will see the effects of this unfolding tragedy for decades to come. Many places in Africa we see a downward spiral, making countries increasingly weak. The important challenge is to address the underlying causes and to arrest this descent before we are forced to deal with the ultimate consequences. Famine, unrest, and human suffering. Consequences which will touch everyone. The loss of so much human potential will indeed resonate around the world. Let us think of other areas where HIV is now creeping in. China, India, the Central Asian Republics. Knowing the impact in so many other areas, we cannot stand on the sidelines only to see the HIV crisis unfold before our eyes with the economic, social, and political devastation it will bring. The short, sharp impact of conflict more quickly than AIDS bring to light the inevitable links between health and development, between health and security, the obvious, the war wounded, soldiers and civilians, the medium term impacts, people uprooted, displaced to camps with little sanitation or health services, schools disrupted and food insecurity. And last year, the shortest, sharpest shock of all, an outbreak which captured imagination, often more column inches, in fact, than the war in Iraq, happening at the same time, and always more headlines than AIDS, TB, or malaria. Severe acute respiratory syndrome put the world on high alert and drove unprecedented cooperation to stop a disease which had an immediate and negative impact on markets, on tourism, on trade, and on hospitals, even in the most developed countries with the most advanced health systems, such as in Canada, the neighboring country to the United States. One person infected, staying at an international hotel, put the world at risk. And unlike other diseases, which we can prevent or treat, SARS was undiagnosable, untreatable, and for one of every six people, fatal. The way the world responded to SARS was global public health at its best. Scientists put aside their differences, their drives to be the first. They came together, they shared sequencing, and studied results. Doctors from around the world came together in virtual conferences to share advice on how to best treat patients. Public health authorities from opposite sides of the globe flew to Geneva to share their experiences with SARS. Their success and failures with 192 members of the World Health Organization. And as a result, in just four short months, we had identified a new disease and contained a global outbreak which could have become a global catastrophe. The short, sharp shock made us all stand up and pay attention. Due to the speed of science and using the best evidence, we quickly knew that SARS could infect anyone. Governments became committed, resources made available, people made aware, health workers given tools for action, information shared across borders. In short, there was global mobilization to fight a global threat. The result, we probably won't find ourselves 10 years down the road with SARS also endemic in the countries which can least afford it, devastating lives and economies, because we acted to make sure that didn't happen. 
and we found that it was in everyone's interest to act. In today's connected societies, there was no choice. It was impossible to hide SARS in a world with the internet and email, even in China. Impossible to pretend it didn't exist or that it was already contained. It, the consequences of doing so were mistrust in government and in economies. Societies had been shaken to their foundation. Fundamental questions were raised about the handling of disease, the handling of media and communication, and of one's own constituents. But to better understand the even wider picture, we must go back to the more slow creep of disease. Who is affected and why? These diseases that we can protect ourselves against, malaria, TB, HIV, measles, diarrheal disease, respiratory infections, are impacting people in the poorest countries where economies don't grow, where social unrest, unemployment, and the threat of civil conflict force the stagnation of health and education systems. And I'm not talking about small numbers here. Between 1990 and 2000, the so-called Human Development Index declined in nearly 30 countries. I mean, we're all thinking that there is some progress. How much do economies grow? How much better off are we 10 years later? But here, 30 countries went down. Well over a billion people, more than one-fifth of the world population, are unable to meet their daily minimum needs. Almost one-third of all children are undernourished. In many countries which have seen economic growth, increasing inequality means that the poorest part of the population has seen little or none of the benefits from this growth. The average African household consumes 20% less today than it did 25 years ago. To me, this is an unbelievable statistic. Imagine in the US, in Europe, anywhere else in the world, over 25 years to lose from a low level going down 20% more. A world where a billion people are deprived, insecure and vulnerable, is an unsafe world. The separation between domestic and international health problems is losing its usefulness as people and goods travel across borders, across continents. More than two million people cross international borders every single day, about a tenth of humanity each year. And of these, more than a million travel from developing to industrialized countries each week. So trade flows of raw materials, goods and services have increased 15-fold since 1945. Investment flows have multiplied more dramatically still, fundamentally changing the way that economies and societies interact. We also know that in poor countries where people feel powerless and watch as much of the world gets richer, they can bundle hatred and channel it in the most devastating ways. A giant construction site where the World Trade Center used to be will always remind us of a world of conflict, a world divided. It exposes a new awareness of our vulnerability. We must counter this manipulation of despair. We should seek to engage even more strongly with overcoming the gaps, engage with countries in crisis to promote the values of democracy, justice, and human rights. Now, despite the long successes in health achieved 
during the 20th century. The balance sheet is indelibly stained by the avoidable burden of disease that the world's disadvantaged populations continue to bear. Despite those great achievements, successes have been unevenly distributed. 1.3 billion people have entered the 21st century without having benefited from the health revolution. These are the people who are still living in absolute poverty. That is living on less than US $1 a day. The health impact of this inequality gap is staggering, despite the rise in average global life expectancy. In the least developed countries, three out of four people die before the age of 50. Infant mortality is almost seven times higher in a developing country than in industrialized ones. A child born in a developing country today runs a thousandfold greater risk of dying from measles than a child here in the US or in Europe. Children living in absolute poverty have a five-fold greater probability of dying before their fifth birthday than their wealthier counterparts. And tragically, giving birth in Africa is a perilous undertaking for far too many women. Where the statistics are the worst, one woman in every 16 faces death because of poor health and bringing new children into the world, not getting the care she needs when she's pregnant. By contrast, in Europe and Northern America, North America, such a tragedy, maternal mortality, will hit only one woman out of 4,000. There is no indicator than maternal, the, such as maternal mortality to illustrate the disparities so starkly in this world. Now, for many years we have heard a certain conventional wisdom going like this. Poor nations just need time, perhaps more than anticipated, before they will start the natural process of export-led growth and penetration of global markets. Today we know that this is not wisdom at all for a growing number of countries. The truth is that many countries and hundreds of millions of people are not only stagnating, they are going backwards in this downward spiral that I mentioned. Populations in many of the poorest countries have also become much harder to reach as the iron hand of the Cold War loosened its grip. Some countries enjoyed new freedoms, but in other areas, paradoxically, the result was conflict, marginalization, ethnic strife, and collapsing states. In these disappearing countries, the work of donors, NGOs, and international agencies is fast becoming almost impossible. Now, poverty breeds disease. We have more than any other single cause, just as disease breeds poverty. In countries in crisis, rates of severe illness and death are high. In some settings, during such crisis, the daily death rate is at least double the expected average level. One of the key signs of a failing state is its growing inability to provide even basic services for its population. A descent into poverty and lawlessness leads to rapid declines in health indicators, such as infant mortality and life expectancy. At CIA, where the analysts we're used to counting warheads and troops. They are now paying attention to changing child mortality rates as a telling sign of a state heading into collapse. The experiences over the past years 
show that we neglect countries in crisis at our peril. Economic crisis in distant countries now reverberate in financial markets around the world. Mass migrations from failed states can topple governments and provoke conflict, even genocide. Pandemics such as AIDS can cut so deeply into the basic fabric of countries <coughs> that their social, economic, and political repercussions destabilize whole regions. But never forget, health can also be a bridge to peace. Efforts to eradicate polio have brought entire regions together. Mass um, 16 countries across West Africa where health workers cross borders to vaccinate children in neighboring villages, where warring factions laid down their weapons and picked up a vaccine vial, where 60 million children were vaccinated against polio in less than a week. In the spring of 2003, the world also came together in the largest act of unity for health. 192 countries adopted the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the first truly international health treaty, about time, 2003. Implementation of the treaty will see tobacco advertising banned increases in the price of tobacco products, efforts to control smuggling, and more smoke-free places. I wonder, can, can we have water, Ola? Underneath. Ah, thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> it's quite important. <laughs> but, this tobacco convention had many opponents, many actively fighting to undermine the spirit and the letter. But those who wanted and needed most prevailed. Developing countries made the strongest push to see the convention adopted. I don't think many people are aware of that. The African continent were really strongly behind it. Through this instrument, they have the power now to keep the tobacco industry from encroaching further, and the power to reverse the current trend, which, if left to fester, would kill 10 million people, not four, as today, per year, due to tobacco. That is foresight for health, development, and for global security. It illustrates the world creating a global public good. I believe we are now standing at the threshold of a major shift in thinking. Until recently, many development professionals argued that the health sector is only a minor player in efforts to pr improve the overall health of populations. And the overwhelming majority of finance officials and economists believed that health is relatively unimportant, both as a development goal and as a strategy for reducing poverty. Health spending was seen as consumption rather than investment. But this is changing. Health may be far more central to poverty reduction than our macroeconomist colleagues previously thought. That poverty breeds ill health is nothing new. I mentioned it. But we now know much more about how ill health triggers a vicious cycle, hampering economic and social development, and contributing to unsustainable resource depletion and environmental degradation. Now we are learning that the reverse is also true. An even more powerful lesson Health gains, in fact, trigger economic growth. And if the benefits of that growth are evenly distributed, this can lead to poverty reduction. 
If you think back, as in Europe, in the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, we have seen that developing countries, which invest relatively more and well in their people's health, are likely to achieve higher economic growth. In East Asia, for example, life expectancy increased by more than 18 years in the two decades that preceded the most dramatic economic takeoff in history. The Asian Development Bank concluded that fully one third of the phenomenal Asian growth between 65 and 97 resulted from investment in people's health. Today, more and more economists and development specialists recognize that if public funds are carefully spent and lead to improvements in people's health, they represent an investment in any country's prime asset, its own people. Developing country leaders from Africa, Central and South Asia, and Latin America maintain that if the world's poorest countries are to have any chance of catching up with the rest, they need to invest in health. This was concluded at the big conference in Monterey, not so far from here, by world leaders uh, financing for development. The stewards of the global economy in the World Bank and IMF and in the treasuries of the richer nations are reaching the same conclusion. There are several reasons for this shift in thinking. One is the growing recognition that our world is turning into a two-speed global society. Perhaps a billion people are enjoying unprecedented prosperity and advantage, while nearly half are living on less than $2 a day and have extremely limited prospects for prosperity. Another is the realization that this perpetuation of poverty and deprivation creates an insecure world for us all. A third is new evidence on the ways in which frequent and severe illness keeps people poor, keeps societies poor and prevents them taking advantage of opportunities to earn, to learn, and to have a better life. At WHO, I put a key emphasis on the need to get our science and evidence right. Not only our health evidence, but also the evidence about the interaction between health and development. Led by Professor Jeffrey Sachs, now at Columbia University, the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health that I created delivered a report that will remain a landmark in improving our understanding of how wise health interventions can spur development. The Commission's report provided a reference for any policymaker, in rich and poor countries alike. It offers a strategy for investing in health for economic development especially in the world's poorest countries, based upon a new partnership of the developing and the developing developed countries. Now the question is, do we have enough uh, foresight and vision to do what is necessary? That is the kind of question that should be on everybody's mind as they also go to the polls six days from now. Because, as I spoke with some of the faculty and students earlier today, there is one obvious uh, citizen duty. And that is at least once every four years to give an opinion about development in one's own society. People have gradually, over the last 50 years, been voting at lower and lower percentages of the total population. That's a decreasing democracy developing. And it's not only in the US, although it's worse here. It also happens in Europe. Lower participation in major election efforts. 
because unless every individual feels a certain responsibility for his or her own society, how are democracies going to be developing in such a way that we can take a stand on the critical issues of our time? Now, what this commission came to, and they were economic experts and health experts put together, was that if you see to it that a relatively uh, few key interventions to prevent and to deal with disease in populations are done, you could save millions of lives each year, reduce poverty, spur economic development, and promote global security. So that message is very clear. And these conclusions illustrated my own convictions and observations over a long life in public service. We need to invest in people, in their health, in their education, not only to promote human rights, but also to improve societies, to spur economic growth, and to do better. Malaria alone taxed Africa's GDP by about $100 billion compared to what it could have been if that disease had been controlled and tackled 30 years ago when effective control measures first became available. We used them in Europe, we used them in the US and the American continent. They were not used in Africa because of the poverty situation there. The Commission presented, I think, a definitive argument for the need to invest as part of a basic development strategy. It shows quite simply how investments in health are an important prerequisite for economic development. In fact, and I think we all can imagine, when we think about it, competition in a global marketplace will not provide enough incentives for poor countries to move out of poverty. They just don't have a chance. Humanitarian aid and development assistance have contributed greatly to reduce suffering and increase security. Never believe those who say that all this money is wasted. Without it and without the effort that many countries have done in the last 50 years, we would have been even worse off. We should expect, however, even more. After a decade of shrinking resources for international development, donors have become increasingly focused on support for quality programs that promise to yield measurable results. It is a sign of hope that several key donors have made commitments to raise, not lower, their levels of official development assistance. And it has happened only in the last couple of years. So there is a tendency, there is an increased awareness, understanding that we are in this together and that we cannot avoid taking on our own conscience and our own, about our own future, the destiny of peoples far away from us, but in, on the same globe, and where we all have a responsibility to be part of the solution. I am myself a strong proponent of looking at measuring positive results. It's the best way to increase the willingness to contribute. So now, as you know, in the year 2000, 140 leaders of, the United, of our world nations in, in New York committed to what is called the Millennium Development Goals. They are focused on overcoming poverty, and many of these goals are linked to health, directly or indirectly. So ladies and gentlemen, we see what disease uh, can bring to our world, we see that foresight, investment, and cooperation can make the difference. HIV has been with us for three decades, 
and the impact on societies is too well known. By contrast, the global effort to contain SARS with determination and speed limited the impact to thousands, not hundreds of thousands of cases. We also face threats from the environment and what humans can do to manipulate it. We have already had one anthrax scare, and each of us in this room, I'm sure, has probably considered the threat of bioterrorism. SARS jumped from nature to humans, a rare occurrence requiring perfect conditions from the point of view of the virus. And while far from a simple undertaking, bioterrorism is controlled by people, not by nature. So how to counter this threat? Well, the tools to be prepared are in fact the same. Boosting capacity for disease surveillance is key to detecting all disease, whether created by nature, by humans. Currently, the system is not strong enough. Our experience with SARS exposed the weaknesses. Globally, including in developing countries, we must strengthen disease surveillance and control. SARS was a warning to all of us, which push, pushed even the most advanced health systems to the breaking point. We must take the opportunity now to rebuild our public health protections. And they are global, not just national or regional. At the World Health Assembly in, 2000 and, no, in May 2003, Member States adopted a resolution which would see revised and uh, strengthened international health regulations. The key is a system where infectious diseases are found, they are reported, identified and stopped. Depending on the threat, this will require continued international cooperation. A system where all recognize that any disease no matter if it's affecting rich or poor, will touch us all at some point. Globalization, I'm sure you are all aware, also carries with it changing, rapidly changing lifestyles. So in our preparation for World Health Report 2002, we focused on reducing risks, promoting healthy life. Surprising to many, not only underweight, but overweight, was to be found among the 20 most important risk factors globally. Until recently, blood pressure, cholesterol, tobacco, alcohol, and obesity, and the diseases that are linked to them, had been thought to be concerns just for industrialized countries. No, the report showed how they are becoming more and more prevalent in developing nations, creating a double burden on top of the infectious disease burden. There is a risk transition happening with marked changes in patterns of living. In many developing countries, rapid increases in body weight are being recorded now, particularly among children, adolescents, and young adults. And as you know, Obesity rates have risen dramatically, threefold or more in some parts of North America, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Pacific Islands, Australia and China, in fact, since 1980. There's been a dramatic trend. Changes in food processing and production and in agriculture and trade policies have affected the daily diet of hundreds of millions of people. The rise in inactivity was also identified. We all know what it means in our daily lives. Accounting for between 15 and 20% of the risk to develop cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. In 2002, the World Health Assembly, therefore, adopted a resolution to develop a global strategy on diet, physical activity, and health, inspired by a joint expert consultation between WHO and FAO, the Global Agricultural Organization. And uh, now, in 2004, the Assembly has adopted a global strategy. 
And I'm happy to say that the scientifically based recommendations were taken seriously by responsible member states. Although they looked as if they could be watered down due to strong pressure from important industries such as the sugar industry and other food industries. But the World Health Assembly prevailed. So I believe no denial is a good slogan. What does it mean? We need to limit the consumption of saturated fats and trans fatty acids, salt and sugar. And this is not just US, Europe, it is the world. We need to increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables and the levels of physical activity. Earlier this year, in a, an exchange with the food industry, I noticed the following statement coming from them. And this is a quote. There is a movement in Europe, the US, and parts of Asia to legislate what people eat and drink. Mm. Um, more, more water, less Coca-Cola, of course. Uh, affixing blame and passing new laws won't move us towards a solution. End of quote. But my reply to this was, yes, I agree. We must recognize that in these situations there is no quick fix. We all know how difficult it can be to change our habits. There is no silver bullet. Laws are no quick fix. But they are the expression of common responsibility within and across nations. Well prepared, they can help foster solutions, help set the right standards, help true competition in what I called a level playing field for industries. I told them about my own experience as a young uh, doctor, as a political leader, as a young environment minister 30 years ago. I argued strongly for road safety and for our responsibility as a society to promote safe school roads for our children. Action school roads was something I, a political initiative I took, and I convinced the finance minister to give me budget funds for this. And it was created with public funds supporting walking paths across the country within a four kilometer zone around all our schools. My concern 30 years ago was avoiding death and disability due to car accidents. However, today, when we really must stimulate increased physical activity, we can be grateful that those infrastructures are preventive tools in a much broader perspective. More children walk and more children bicycle than would otherwise have been the case, and their parents, their grandparents, have easy access to safe roads for walking and cycling. The WHO strategy recommends a prevention-oriented approach to this issue, the need for countries to develop multi-sectoral approaches with a long-term sustainable perspective to make the healthy choices the preferred alternative at both the individual and the community level. It recommends the control of food and marketing to children and health claims to packaging, improved nutrition labeling and health education. Now, working with industry, with food retailers, consumers groups, it was possible to develop such a strategy. And I think we have already seen uh, programs in several countries uh, regarding marketing and promotion of junk food to children. And there is broad agreement uh, and scientific evidence behind those recommendations. In fact, a US study showed that children younger than eight could not tell the difference between ad adver advertising and reality. So if, if you freely can advocate and advertise for children, their ability to understand and to take a stand 
It's just not there. They have not matured to be able to make informed decisions about such issues. So it's very important that we are aware that as a society and as a world, we need to cooperate and we need to regulate to have opinions about what is acceptable and not acceptable within our societies for the benefit of all of us. And especially when it has to do with children and the situation for future generations. Now, I want to conclude that in today's world, we need a shift in awareness towards the idea of building global public goods that can help us reap the huge benefits and potential benefits of globalization, while at the same time containing some of the risks and vulnerabilities that comes with it. The main question is one of taking responsibility, of using our democracies to promote necessary change. And investing in health is an obvious choice. It saves lives, millions of lives, but it will also boost the economy of poor countries and of the world. Thank you very much.